everyone. Uh, welcome to the Greater Columbus Sports Commission's Virtual Sports Report. I am Linda Logan, Executive Director of the Sports Commission and your host today. So excited to have two special guests, uh, friends of Columbus and no stranger to the work that we do. Um, ESPN's Debbie Antonelli and Beth Mowens are joining us live um, from the Women's Final Four in San Antonio. And we're so very happy to have you here today. And for our listeners, um, those of you that are listening live, we are going to have questions at the end of the program that you can put in the chat button. So uh, we're gonna just get started. So welcome ladies, so happy to have you here. And uh, what's going on in San Antonio? All good, Linda. I mean, excited about the final four. The, the four teams that are here are really outstanding, and uh, it should be a lot of fun to watch uh, the, over the weekend. Yep. You know, you've got, uh, you've got some of the usuals uh, that are here, and uh, Connecticut a chance to go for a 12th. Uh, it's been 29 years, believe it or not, since uh, Tara last won the national championship. Um, and then you've also got, uh, you know, Dawn Staley here and Adia Barnes, Arizona for the first time. So you got a little new blood in there with the Wildcats. Well, first we're going to just kick it off. And I know there's a lot to talk about with some of the things happening with the women's program, but tell us about San Antonio and living in the bubble and what that's been like uh, and what you're observing for not only players and coaches, but even for yourselves and what that's been like. Uh, I got a chance to experience the bubble on the men's side in Indianapolis as well. And uh, this, the same goes here. We're considered tier three. We have no interaction with the players or coaches except for Zoom. Uh, and in each situation, when I checked into my hotel, I checked in with a loaf of bread and peanut butter and jelly, and I can survive on that if I need to. Uh, but we've been pretty, um, pretty isolated, very careful about everywhere we go, wear a mask everywhere we go. And uh, Beth and I were required required to wear a mask on the air uh, for ESPN over the, the, the past week. So um, it's been uh, pretty quiet. It's not the typical, you know, meet you in the lobby for a drink kind of environment that we're used to. Uh, we're getting a little bit more rest and a lot more prep. <laughs> uh, the, the river walk, uh, which usually, you know, would be uh, the good kind of insanity during a final four has been kind of quiet. Uh, the weekend was a little hectic. We you know, you avoid the crowds. Uh, you know, we get out, uh, Debbie and I have been out for exercise in the morning before it gets too busy out there. And, uh, and, and then pretty much, you know, we're around the hotel most of the day. We spend a, a ton of time on Zoom calls and, um, you know, sort of keep to ourselves. We, we all were just tested this morning. So the, the only people that we really um, hang out with are, you know, sort of the other announcers since we've all uh, tested negative and and even then we're you know very careful about uh, um, you know masking up or, or staying socially distanced. We uh, hosted the division two uh, basketball tournament last week so understand all the different tier levels and what that takes to pull it off. We only had eight teams so I can only imagine you know the San Antonio event organizers you know all the work that they've had to do to put into uh, into the effort. I will say this, uh, Linda, though, if we may add on, and, and uh, Debbie has experienced the same thing. A lot of the coaches and players love this idea, um, even post-pandemic, to be able to stay in one place, to play the elite uh, Sweet 16, to play the Elite Eight. You don't have to worry about flying all over the place. You, you don't have to worry about switching, you know, hotels three times during the tournament. So um, it, it's something I, I hope they will explore e even after the pandemic. That, that sounds great. I know um, Columbus, that would be a, an interesting concept. I know that you all have talked about in the past. So more to come on that. I guess we are, we're all learning these great life lessons. How, how has that preparation changed? I know both of you are so thorough in the work that you do. Do you feel like you have more time for that right now? I do. I mean, uh, I was just telling Beth yesterday, you know, um, I mean, I love to watch film. I do miss going to practice. That's the, the, the hardest part about this is not being able to be in the gym because you pick up some subtle things about game prep or just some uh, coach speak or, or basketball vernacular that you don't typically hear in conversation with just your friends. So you get to be up close and personal with the coaches, but it also allows um, me to dive into a little bit deeper on a topic uh, with a team that I might not have had the time to explore before, like... Uh, I was saying yesterday, Aaliyah Boston is the great 6'5 center for South Carolina. She's a double-double and 
She's an all American and she's a great player. But yesterday I had time to dive into Synergy, which is a resource we have to watch film. And, and it's a very high analytic resource that we can use for prep. And I watched on Synergy all of Aaliyah Boston's assists and all of her turnovers because I was curious about her. She's such a good passer. I was just curious about where on the floor would if I was putting a defensive game plan together, how I would try to guard her and what are some of the things I would try to do. So, you know, for my prep, if she catches the ball in the high post and she continues to throw that high low pass down to the block or she continues to reverse it to a three, I'm going to put a lot of pressure on her and make her dribble. I'm not going to let her pass from up there because we know when she goes to the block, she's a, you know, she's going to score. You have to double her and turn her into a passer there, but I want to make her dribble on the top of the floor. So I may not have had the time to do that if I was traveling or, um, um, you know, we weren't, we weren't all in the same spot and we had extra time. Yeah. Debbie, hey. do you think that the coaches call you for insight, the two of you every now and again? Yes. Um, there have been times um, that coaches call and, you know, they're curious about what you see, but I, I do think that the time, uh, there's a lot of times that coaches, you know, they, they're always teasing us that they watch the game with the sound down. Uh, I don't. <laughs> we I know don't, they watch it with the sound on. <laughs> yeah. If Beth is calling the game, they're watching with the sound up. Um, yeah. because we do have, you know, I mean, we do, we do work at it and I think they respect that. And that's probably why. Well, what I've been able to observe, you know, I know the other night on the broadcast, you mentioned that the two of you have been doing this for 20 years, but you've seen the game certainly grow and, and uh, you've had that front row seat. Can you talk a little bit about the, the growth of the game and then talk a little bit about now some of the things that have been front and center and um, with some of the controversy that we're hearing about equity? Yeah, you know, I, I think for those of us that have been around athletics our whole life, uh, we wish uh, that you know, some of the inequities were, were new. Uh, they're not. They've been around a long time. And I think the, the hope is that moving forward, um, we, the, the leadership uh, provides a much clearer path um, towards that, that kind of equity and that we don't have the kind of missteps or, you know, uh, oversights that, that we had this time around. Obviously, uh, the pandemic affected a lot of things, but uh, that that can't be used as an excuse. And, uh, you know, I, I hope that the leadership will um, be able to do a much better job with that moving forward. Uh, as, as far as the game, I mean, it continues to grow. The athleticism continues to get better. Uh, people have better diets. Uh, they have better um, weight rooms and, and all kinds of um, conveniences. I think they, they have much more access to tape and the synergy and and to watch game film a lot easier than, than back in the day. So I think the game has continued to grow. Uh, the, the ratings are way up for the both the NCAA and the WNBA in the summer. So I think those are very encouraging. And for the first time this year, we had games on ABC. So I wouldn't be surprised if in the not too distant future, the, the Final Four is, is on ABC. Debbie? Yeah, um, I mean, you know, I see the game through the offensive lens and I've been seeing it through that way for a long time because I think the product is so good. Uh, and I, I think the way these athletes, as Beth mentioned, the train and, and prepare and the opportunities that they have from a resource standpoint on their own campuses with, you know, private gyms and shooting machines and massage therapists and nutritionists and all the stuff that they have to be the best that they can be. And, uh, you know, I'm, I am a shoot till your arm fall off, uh, uh, you know, analyst. I, I think offense is the, the key. I mean, and I want players to continue to evolve and continue to be able to score. And that has led us to where we are now that we can have that kind of conversation about uh, where and what spots and how growing the game should matter and, and what does that actually mean? I mean, having the conversation, everybody says we wanna grow the game, we wanna grow the game, but we, we need to define what that looks like and what that means. And because of the inequities that have been exposed by the players and coaches uh, from the way the NCAA has treated the two different tournaments, I think this is a prime time to open up the conversation and everything should be on the table and yeah. everything including a potential format change that we've discussed in the past. I mean, I, I don't see any reason why 
this model that we're living in right now, minus the isolation of the pandemic, can't be something that actually moves the economic uh, needle for women's college basketball, which will eventually move it for the pros. And, you know, we all operate in our own silos and we really shouldn't. It's one game that we're all trying to grow and there's ways that we could work together. And if, if you know, we always have these conversations, I've been having the same conversation for 30 plus years, but I wanna see some movement now and I think we will. Yeah, I, I agree. I think there's, it hit a nerve certainly. and. Uh, just even the casual fan is weighing in on this, which is, I think, a good thing, right? So we're seeing more, um, more dialogue. And as a community that loves to host women's events, you know, we're, we're hosting the NCAA Volleyball Championships later this year. And, you know, I love to see the, the growth of all women's sports. And, and both of you have had your part in playing into that growth. I, I guess I want to talk a little bit about your maybe transition to how your careers have grown over the years. Maybe we'll start with you, Beth. I know you're heading over to do softball later this weekend and you're doing some happy opening day, by the way, right? Yes, yeah, Chicago yeah. Cubs, yes. As a, as a Tribe <laughs> fan, that hurts now. just we're a all, little. We're all Cubs now. fans now because of Beth. That's right. <laughs> so maybe talk about that and, and the opportunities that have been provided to both of you. Well, I think the, the other big movement afoot, Linda, um, and especially with a lot of the um, social justice uh, conversations over the course of the summer and, and through the new year is, you know, the idea that if you see it, you can be it. And so for a lot of younger women, um, you know, athletics just came about with Title IX and you could see it, then you could be the athlete. And the confidence that you get, I think, from playing sports is, is something that has served both Debbie and I well, you know, through our careers. And so I, I think there are, there's, um, there are a lot of people now that are making the decisions when it comes to what faces and voices are on TV and radio that uh, we need more African-Americans, we need more women, we need more minorities, uh, because the, the fact is even for Major League Baseball and for the NFL, a couple of other places that I work, the fan base is about 45% women. Um, so, you know, why is it that uh, all of the, you know, 95% of the announcers are guys. So I, I'm, I'm thrilled that the Cubs decided um, to make some changes and that they wanted me to be a part of that. I'll probably have, you know, a 10 or a dozen games over the course of the summer during the regular season. So um, I'm really looking forward to that. And, you know, I think the, that uh, the basketball season, uh, ends and kicks right into the Masters and then the start of the baseball season. And we start uh, moving right into, um, you know, the, the Women's College World Series and the Men's College World Series. And as you addressed, Linda, even now with some of the fall sports being played in the spring with, with volleyball headed your way, uh, there, there's a lot of exciting things, I think, on the sports casting front as well as on, on the playing fields. Debbie, you had a, a great career um, in Columbus um, several years back when you were working for Ohio State and, and our Columbus Quest. And, you know, it's been fun to, to see your career just skyrocket. Well, it's a long ways from um, a couple of old stops you and I used to hang out in in Athens, Ohio, isn't it, Linda? Um, there you go. We've yeah. got our own bar stools, don't we? <laughs> yeah, I think we do. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I continue to be so proud and impressed of what Beth does. Um, you know, I, I have had a chance to sit next to her for 20 years and for all the fighting and arguing and sister-like things that we go through, I mean, she's the ultimate professional. And I think our teamwork together is, you know, r really sharp. I mean, we, we bring it and we both know each other's responsibility and when it comes to basketball and, um, you know, it just makes it more fun because you can count on your partner and, I think that's really important when you've been working with somebody for so long. Um, the best thing I can say about getting a chance to work for CBS on the men's tournament, you know, I'm not the first woman to call NCAA tournament men's games, but it was about 25 years between the time that Ann Myers had a chance and that I got my opportunity. And uh, this is what I've been saying, you know, and sort of like Beth was saying about normalizing the face and the voice on TV. The first year that I worked for CBS, which was five years ago on the men's tournament, the publicity was incredibly uh, large. I even had a New York Times reporter, or, or no, excuse me, I had a New York Times photographer in my house following me <laughs> around for an hour and a half 
And I thought, man, I've been working in the men's game since the mid nineties. I don't get why it's such a big deal. But I also knew that there was great responsibility that came with it and that there would be a lot of people counting on me. And I'm sure Beth knows exactly what I'm talking about, feeling the pressure of being the first in the NFL or the first in Major League Baseball or whatever with the Cubs. You know, there are a lot of people that are watching and there are people counting on you. And so the first year I had all this publicity, coast to coast media, and it was overwhelming. But Five years later, this year, not one person called me to write a story about me being the female analyst on the CBS men's tournament. I'm the analyst. I'm not the female analyst. And the first year I may have been that. And that isn't why I was able to keep my job. So um, that's what I would say about that. And it is a real comforting uh, validation of your work ethic and the time that you've put in and how we go about conducting our business that uh, has allowed us to have these opportunities. It's it's basically uh, embedded in incredible hard work and it keep working and just keep mm -hmm. building your own confidence because there's a lot of people out there that could try to tear it down, but you just got to keep building it. And I, and personally myself, you know, I, I'm for the last five years, you know, I do a girls only sports camp that has continued to evolve in my community and what I do with that camp is I'm giving little girls ages six to 11 an opportunity to experience 20 different sports and hope that they'll pick one that they'll really enjoy that they'll want to play or they'll pick several because I'm not big on specializing but um, I want we understand the value of sport and we know what it can mean for your life, not just your a career but what it can do to empower young women to be able to believe that they can do what they want. And as Beth said, if you can see it, then you can do it. Well, that's a great segue for us to just talk a little bit about Columbus. And I know that you both have, you know, been able to grace our stage uh, for the women's sports report. You were here. It's three years ago today that Arike hit that wow. big shot to win the, the final four. So, so, you know, giving us the opportunity to have people like yourselves uh, share your stories is very important to us and the work that we do at the Greater Columbus Sports Commission. So we want to keep that up and maybe any suggestions that you have for us um, and what your experiences have been like coming to Columbus. I think our viewers would like to hear that. Oh, I mean, I, I love Columbus. I, I can't think of a negative. Uh, I spent four years of my early part of my career there. Um, uh, I have a lot of incredibly fond memories of my time in Columbus. I know what a great sports town it is. I know what Ohio State means to the community. Uh, I get what you guys do and how much you have created this broad-based sports platform for Columbus and for young girls to experience. And uh, Linda, your leadership is incredibly outstanding. I mean, uh, you know, to do what you were able to do and bring the Final Four to Columbus and to create the opportunities that you created in your own community for a bunch of little girls, um, and not just little girls, but little boys. As a mother of three boys, I think it's equally important that bo little boys understand why little girls should be playing also and, and what value they get from that is, uh, also. But I mean, my time at Ohio State and my four years there were some of the best times of my life. And uh, Columbus is always gonna have a, a special place in my heart. And uh, I have a lot of really, really good dear friends that, that are family that still live there. And uh, I love coming there and I hope to be there soon. I'll let you know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Debbie's town. I just get to visit it, Linda. Um, she has been uh, gracious enough over the years to introduce me to some of those friends in town. And so I, I, I feel like that's a, a place that I, one of my favorite places to come visit uh, you know, working in, in college football for a handful of years with Joey Galloway. Uh, so, you know, he would always, um, you know, talk up Columbus and what a great place it is. And he still lives in the area. So uh, it, it's, it's unique to be able to call games at the shoe or over at the shot. And, you know, the athletics uh, people at Ohio State are always wonderful to deal with. And, and the fan base is so passionate and, and such a pleasure to, to hang out with. So, uh, keep on doing what you're doing. Um, Linda, I will, I will say, you know, um, Dr. Christine Johnson, the president of the Ohio State University is a personal friend of mine and Beth's. We have known her for 20 years. Uh, what an incredible ambassador for the university in the state of Ohio. You're, you all, if you haven't met her, 
I suggest you try. She is an incredibly smart and talented. And I mean, I, she was gracious enough to come on my little podcast, you know, that I have. Um, she's a great leader. And uh, it's, it, I'm so proud of Ohio State for having hired somebody that, that is Chris Johnson. She's amazing. And then of course we love Gene Smith. I mean, we've known him for a long time as well. So, I mean, you get to work with a lot of great leaders in your community. We, we really do, it's, it's been exciting. So believe it or not, our time has uh, come to uh, turn this over to Riley. She's got some questions for us and then we'll let you both get back to work. Yeah, hi guys. So first question, I guess, just circling back to the tournament right now. Um, you both mentioned viewership as kind of a way to grow the game. And I think we see that when the game is put on these larger networks, the demand is there. You know, there's a lot of conversation about if you put the product out there, it will reach people and people will respond. So I'm wondering, you know, when we look at games like the Elite Eight game with UConn and Baylor and it just had record ratings, I'm wondering how you guys think that impacts the growth of the game to put those star players out there to expose them to kind of a new audience of fans that otherwise may not really have, have been exposed. Well, I think we're starting to see um, the reach of not only the women's games, but the athletes. Uh, there was a, a great article on social media and the impact that female athletes are having on social media. And when you compare the, the women to the men that were in the Elite Eight uh, or Sweet 16, I believe five of the top eight social media influencers were women. And so as name, image, and likeness starts to come into being, that, that's another big thing where I, I think the growth of the game, the reach of the game on television will benefit a lot of these female athletes and will, I think, really start to show a lot more of their worth, their value, if you will. And, you know, that that's really, as Debbie can attest, that's what drives television. It's the ratings, it's the advertising dollars and, and things like that. And so, it, when the games are appearing on ABC, when the ratings are, are starting to push over the, you know, close to and over the $2 million mark, it, it's going to have a huge impact on how the TV bosses then start looking at, well, we need to fill these windows um, on uh, in better time slots and on the bigger networks. Yes, if they're watching, that means that they're paying attention. And if they're paying attention, ratings are gonna go up. And if ratings continue to go up, then there's a sales component that we've created some inventory that should be available to keep growing and moving the game forward. And not just ratings. I'm gonna throw a wild card at you, Linda. And I, I know we don't have much time, but I'm just gonna say this. You know, When we get to the Sweet 16, there are lines on the women's games. And the gambling lines are really important. Because yep. if people are putting money on the women's games, that means they're paying attention. That means that it's gonna affect ratings. And that means that the game's gonna to continue to grow. It's an unbelievable way to monetize and to move forward a demographic on the women's side between 18 and 48 that really doesn't get pushed in women's sports. That is going to bring incredible attention. And as every state starts to legalize sports gambling, um, that is a big part of growing the women's game. And uh, I, I think that's a really important piece to keep your eye on. And I'm not advocating gambling. I personally have never bought a lottery ticket, although I do think it is a way to grow the game. We're watching that legislation right now in Ohio. So I, I more to come on that topic for sure. Yeah, it's definitely a, a frontier that, that is wide open right now. Um, and then just to close us out, I think we have to ask, you know, Beth and Debbie, with these final four teams set, do you have anything you're excited to watch, anything that you're keeping a close eye on as we enter tomorrow and these games start? What are you most excited to see? I'm excited to see how UConn defends Ari McDonald, uh, the, the great All-American for Arizona, who has the kind of quicks that you don't ever see in the women's game often. Uh, I'm excited to see if Tara Vandeveer, after a 29-year drought, as Beth mentioned earlier, can actually win a championship. Uh, we have two uh, women of color in the Final Four, which is the first time we've ever had that. That's a big historical opportunity to discuss giving opportunity to women and Black women and why that's important. And, uh, it, you know, we... We just have such a great product. I know the games are going to be outstanding. And the South Carolina 
uh, Stanford game could be down to the last possession. Yeah. I'm always excited uh, that this is the time of year when legends are made. You know, we talk about uh, Cheryl Swoops forever. We'll talk about Enrique shot forever. Uh, the Christy Tolliver three uh, for Maryland. We talk about those moments forever. And so I'm anxious to see who in particular gets to be a part of, of a big moment like that at the final four and, and make their legend and, uh, and live forever in our memories. That, that's always exciting for me. Uh, and we can't go without mentioning Paige Beckers, um, the, the freshman All-American, first time AP player of the year as a freshman, how phenomenal of a player she is and how lucky we are that we're gonna get four, you know, three more years of her after this year. And um, the talent coming in in the freshman class this year and next year uh, oh, yeah. is just remarkable. The game is in great shape. So all these things that we're talking about from a product standpoint allows us to continue to put things in place that need to be put in place. Whatever your definition to grow the game is, I've got one, I'm sure Beth has one, but now is the time to put it all together. Well, we thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule. You, we know that you're right in the thick of things and in San Antonio. Just know that you have an open invitation uh, in Columbus. We just love having you here anytime and uh, appreciate uh, anything else you'd like to add before I have some closing comments? I, I just want to say one thing personally, and that's to you, Linda, and I'm not blowing smoke. I've known you for a long time, and I, I respect so much how you go about conducting your business and, and what you've done for the greater Columbus area, uh, for what a great family community Columbus is, and the sports that you bring makes everyone have a better experience for living there. So congratulations to you and your staff for all the things that you do and how hard you work. Thank you. And, uh, and appreciate uh, Debbie on Westwood One this uh, weekend on the call. I, one of the reviews I saw, I believe, said she was Tony Romo-esque uh, in, in her ability to break down a game. So enjoy that. There you go. We do, looks like we have a question from Carrie. I don't know if you're able to unmute her, Riley, before we close, unless that was maybe not. Um, I want to wonderful. shout out to C Cecilia on your staff and the, the wonderful um, project that her daughter did for Texas A&M and how powerful and impactful that was when uh, Texas A&M, every player on the women's team gave their why and Celia's daughter painted a sneaker for their why and uh, I think it's just an incredible project. Yeah, Gabby, graffiti by Gabby, right? So that's, we're really yeah. proud of, of Gabby. And I know we have Katie Motter on the on the call too. So uh, she's been listening in. So former Ohio State, one of our board members. Mm -hmm. So anyway, well, again, thank you all. Um, we'll look for you this weekend and uh, so much appreciated. And for our viewers, we'll be back doing this again um, on the 15th of April with uh, the NFL's. We've got Aubrey Walton from the NFL and David Gilbert from the Cleveland Sports Commission. They'll be a week away from hosting the NFL draft. So we'll be sharing some words with them as well. So again, Beth and Debbie, thanks so much. Have a safe trip uh, going home next week and see you soon.